can't hear me. Raise your phone. Wait, that doesn't work. Um, and that. so, give me a couple moments to get things set up. But uh, I'm honored to be the first one uh, and that for presenting. I'm pleased to see all of you here, and I'm stunned that many of you are actually awake and vertical at this time of day. Particularly those of you who are coming in from the U.S. West Coast. Good morning. trying to make money off the plugins, but just so that we can isolate those permissions 
so that people opt into the permissions by opting into the plugins. And of course, you know, there could be any other number of reasons why you may want to have plugins inside of your app as well. We will come back to these, or at least the first three of them, uh, and that a little later on here in the presentation. All sorts of apps and that have some sort of plugin or extension or similar sorts of models. Uh, and that the, you rummage your way through the Play Store and that, and there are countless uh, and that, that will show up. And that assumes that you're searching on keywords and that, that are going to trigger coming up with these particular sorts of capable apps. And so whether it is that you are using the plugins to extend the core functionality of an app, or in the case of like a Sony smartwatch where you're really uh, using more of a plug-in style model and that extensions for enabling capabilities on an accessory. Uh, you know, being able to use these plugins, this is a relatively proven scenario and that there are plenty of apps that are taking this approach. So, what are these plugins? What do we need in order to have a successful plug-in model that in our Android app? You might think that I'd start with code, but I'm going to work backwards. Uh, and that the, what you need is to make sure that there's going to be some way that users are going to be able to find this stuff. If you write all these wonderful plugins and nobody downloads them, what was the point? And so there's got to be a way that users are going to be able to find the plugins, decide which ones they want, and readily install them and make use of them. If you're distributing stuff through the Play Store, you may say that, okay, well, the plugins will be on the Play Store, and I'll have my app linked to the Play Store, either for a simple search term. You say that there are particular keywords, like smartwatch, that will go in and you're going to pull up the uh, extensions for your smartwatch manager. Or maybe you will maintain a registry of particular plugins and that, you know, have some JSON file that you download or whatever, and that, that gives the package names of, and descriptions of those that you can have your own presentation, but then link to the Play Store for the user to download those particular plugins. Maybe you like to load up a web page that you're maintaining on your website with a web view that then turns around and fires off downloads from the Play Store or Amazon App Store for Android or what have you. And of course, you can always distribute this stuff independently. Whether even if your main app is distributed through the Play Store, you could say that you're going to control the distribution of the plugins more, um, and then have those be distributed directly off of your website. You link to them from your app, um, and that uh, particularly in the case where these are plugins that you are writing and are unique for your app, you're not exposing an API for third parties. Given that the user actually downloads some of these things, you got to figure out they're there. Your app's got to know that they are around. Your app has got to discover that they are installed, just as the user has to discover that they exist and are available for download. Depending upon the nature of your plugin, there's any number of possible ways that you're going to wind up finding out that these plugins actually made it into the device and are available for your use. Could be that you directly invoke Package Manager and go hunting for your plugins. You might pump by package name. You might pump by particular exposed capabilities. Maybe all plugins need to implement a certain service or broadcast receiver with a particular action. And then you can turn around and use methods like query intent services, query intent receivers on Package Manager in order to be able to find who all implements that. And that's going to be your roster plugins. Maybe you're going more of an approach of a broadcast and response mechanism. You're going to send out a broadcast and you're going to listen for responses. This is a bit more flexible than query intent receivers on package managers simply because this supports dynamic receivers once you would register via register receiver. Um, and that, So maybe somebody's got a long running of service for hopefully justifiable reasons, um, and that they've registered to participate in your plugins, but they've done so dynamically rather than in the manifest. You'd find them this way, whereas you wouldn't with query intent receivers, which only looks at the manifest. Maybe you're going in and you're going to listen for the broadcasts that go out when there's a mix, change in the mix of packages. Packages were added, packages were replaced, packages were removed. 
And you know, you'll find out the package names of what were added or removed, and either because they're on a particular whitelist of known plugins, or you then turn around and use Package Manager to inspect what it is that those packages do to identify whether or not it's one of your plugins, you'll be able to decide, oh wait, oh the user just installed a new plugin, let's now make that available for the user as part of the app configuration. Now that you know that plugins exist on the device, now you get to talk to them. You're going to talk to the plugin and you're going to talk from the plugin in this model and that via IPC. The plugins are APKs. We'll talk about alternatives to that later on. And that, but the dominant model in that, that you see from today is that the plugins are independent apps. And so you're, they're going to, by default, run in their own process. And particularly if it's a third party plugin, you really, really, really want it to run in its own process because you don't know what that plugin might do. And so you're going to use some form of inter process communication. Android's got a ton of inter process communication options just within the standard SDK. Every time you're calling start activity, or start service, or find service, or send broadcast, that could very easily be starting up or otherwise communicating with another process, uh, and that that's inside of one of these plugins. And so you can be saying, okay, well the API for my plugin is you need to implement a service that has a binding interface with this and such AIDL, and, uh, and, that, and it's got to be known, you know, exposed via this particular intent to action, and that's how I'm going to find that you exist, and then that's, I'm going to bind to that service and speak that particular protocol. Services, I mean, plugins could support a content provider and use some way of letting you know what the content provider authority is, and that is subscribed to a particular schema that you've documented saying that this is what uh, we're expecting a plugin to be able to expose. One of the ways that you might actually get that authority is via static data. Not everything that a plugin has to provide is necessarily got to be done dynamically and have to be generated on the fly via Java code. You can have metadata elements for the activity or service or whatever inside of the plugin that your host application is going to be able to query. It's going to be able to find out what those plugins are publishing. And we'll see examples of that here in a bit. The key, though, with all of this communication, both you to the plugin and possibly plugin back to you, is versioning. You're creating an API. And therefore, you're going to have to deal with the fact that you may not necessarily get that API right the first time. Actually, you'll get the API right the first time, but the person sitting next to you, well, they're going to mess it up. And they're, they're, they're going to have to change their API over time. The problem is with these plugins is if they are independent applications installed by uh, independent users, those users are going to decide when they're going to upgrade your app and when they're going to upgrade those plugins. And so if nothing else, you're going to need to make sure that you can deal with the backwards compatibility, that your host is going to have to be able to talk to older plugins where either the user hasn't updated the plugin or possibly the plugin author hasn't updated the plugin, particularly if it's not yours. And so you're going to need to be able to use metadata or something to find out, oh, this plugin is speaking this version of my documented API, therefore I need to bind this way versus binding that way, or things along those lines so that you're going to be able to react. And we need to think about the security problem. We do not want our host talking to arbitrary plugins and leaking things that the user isn't going to want. Similarly, we don't want our plugins leaking things that they think maybe are being only used by our host but aren't and causing harm to the user. So if a plugin is going to be, say, you know, gathering location data that the host application lacks the permissions for that, we need to make sure that that plugin is only going to be providing that information to that host application. It's not going to be letting arbitrary apps that maybe lack the location permission go in and retrieve that, and thereby, uh, you know, to form a hole where privacy data, location, and that is exposed without the user's knowledge. You don't want to be leaking other sorts of data. You know, maybe your host application, your users downloading information, entering information directly on their device. You want to be able to expose some of that to plugins 
but you want to make sure that only the plugins are going to be able to get that and that the user is aware of this data sharing and so that we're not going to wind up with the user wondering, well, how did my information get from this point A to this point B in the plugin, let alone to heaven knows where point C, D through Z might wind up being. And you want to make sure that you are minimizing the possibility of somebody surreptitiously injecting some payload into these plugins and that that causes your host to wind up uh, executing third-party code um, and that that wasn't the intended third-party code. So, let's take a look at an example. And specifically, the one I'm going to focus on first is Dash Clock. Dash Clock is a lock screen widget. And you are, you are looking live at my Galaxy Nexus and a copy of Dash Clock running on my lock screen. And so I have gone in and installed the Dash Clock app. This is the lock screen. You can see the lock icon at the bottom. The top portion is Dash Clock itself. At its core, Dash Clock is a clock. But beyond that, it also has the notion of plugins, extensions, both ones that come with the app and ones that you can obtain through the Play Store, where those extensions will provide additional bits of information that the user can add to the Dash Clock presentation. And so here I've configured three. How many unread email messages I have in Gmail, the weather here in Miami, which could have been simplified as hot and humid, and the time of my next uh, scheduled alarm. I'm scheduled to wake up at 6.20 tomorrow morning, which may cause some of you to question my sanity. Um, and so the and so, I, but I could go in and download any number of other extensions if I want to be able to, you know, display a snippet of a web page in here. There's an extension that offers that. If I want to be able to display um, and that information that about SMSs, uh, unread text messages, I can have a extension in that that will display that information here and so forth. Now. Dash Clock, um, and that was written by Roman Nurek. Many of you will be familiar with Roman, and uh, that he's one of the Google Developer Relations uh, staff members, and that uh, works mostly out of the New York office, and that uh, and he's you know been involved in apps like the IO SCED app, or the Google I/O conference, and that he put together Dash Clock. It's open source. Uh, you search Google for Dash Clock, and that third or so page that comes up is going to be. Um, the actual page for Dash Clock itself out on code.google.com. We use information both on the app itself and on how to write extensions for it, um, and the um, and that and you know all the relevant support information for that. I happen to for my lock screen. I happen to put that as a on a separate. Uh, page of the lock screen and that so Dash Clock had the full screen space, you can arrange to have it literally replace the clock that's on the main pattern lock or pin entry or whatever screen, in which case it will work in a somewhat more compressed visual mode and that. And so we have here the same bits of information. We have the uh, weather, we have the Gmail, and we have the alarm and that, but they're tiny representations rather than the larger ones. But part of the point behind Dash Clock were these extensions. And so Dash Clock, you know, the goal behind it was to have plugins. And you know, Roman released it, we started seeing plugins within days, and there are plenty of them available. The way that users find these is that the app itself has an activity that lists the available extensions that are already on the device, which initially will be the extensions that were baked into Dash Clock itself. But there's an option, get more extensions, which is going to turn around and is going to lead to the Play Store, where the, if the person who has a Dash Clock extension simply says Dash Clock extension somewhere in their product description, it should show up in the search that Dash Clock runs. The user will see that and be able to turn around and install it. Once they install it, Dash Clock is going to turn around and pick it up, as we'll see. If you run this search, there are a few dozen things that advertise themselves as Dash Clock extensions. 
detailed battery information, detailed information about Facebook, content, tasker integration, and so forth. And so the user is able to launch into any of these and be able to, I mean, download them from the Play Store and then turn around and use them from inside the dashboard. Now the way that Roman does that is that he's got a configuration activity. It's your typical, uh, you know, activity that we're going in and being able to configure your preferences. Uh, in his case, so he went with a slightly different UI construction. It's not that he's going in and having a preference activity. He's got his own. He's not even using an, the action bar or the app compat action bar or the action bar Sherlock back toward the action bar. He rolled another implementation of the action bar where he's got his own variation on the overflow and inside of that overflow and that if you choose the get more extensions action, he's just simply going to turn around and launch the Play Store. He's going to start an activity on that magic URL where he is searching for dash clock extension and particularly limiting it to the apps category so that all, you know, when the, you know, the, the Roman Nurek experience uh, and that becomes available as a movie um, and that, that he, he doesn't wind up accidentally displaying that inside of dash clock for as a download. And so he just launches this activity and that, that's going to bring up the Play Store. The user's going to be able to browse through it, find extensions, tap on them, install them. Which is wonderful. But it doesn't do him a lick of good if he does not know that they are there. Uh, the actual activity and that which is displaying the installed plugins uh, and that then the configuration activity has a number of fragments driven by the drop down navigation list uh, and that here it switched over to the extensions one. The, this is showing ones that are part of the dash clock experience itself. Some are just you know, simple ones, some have a little settings entry that the user can tap on to go in and configure, in this case, where are we pulling the weather from? Is it based on current location or do you consistently want weather from your hometown or something like that? And that overflow is where the user gets to go in and launch to go in and take a look at the available dash clock extensions. If the user goes in and installs these things, the primary way the dash clock realizes they're there is via query from package manager. Plugins need to have a particular service with a particular action strip. And he is going to turn around and use query intent service to find those services. And that's how he's going to wind up determining who is all here. So he's got an extension manager class where inside of here, this extension manager is going to go in and let's way down this page. All right, we'll get to it someday. Ah, oh, here we are. Um, and that he's got his get available extensions method, which is going out and finding all of the available extensions. I'm not saying the users activated any of these necessarily, that they're not necessarily showing up in dashboard, but what are the possibilities? What can the user opt into having? And so he's going to grab a package manager and he's going to call query intent services, looking for those services that have advertised themselves as having a service that has the particular magic action strip. That in turn maps to com.google.android.apps.dashclock.extension. And so any plugin that has a service like this, extension manager is going to find. Then it's going to turn around and it's going to read metadata out of here. It's going to be able to go use the information we retrieve from our search via package manager to get at details of the service and particularly the metadata elements, where the metadata elements are going to provide a lot of details about the nature of this plugin necessary to kind of bootstrap communications. One of the big ones being protocol version. That Roman set things up that you have to specifically tell him, okay, I am expecting to speak in this version of your API. Surprisingly enough, he started with version one and has incremented from there to two. 
Um, and that and in principle, he can have more versions over time. But this way, now that he knows the service and he knows the protocol version, now he knows what he needs to do in terms of binding to the right stuff in order to be able to talk to this particular plugin. However, there's also the possibility that the users in that configuration screen, they got the list of installed <coughs> plugins, they go to get more extensions, they install a new plugin, they back button their way to that list of installed plugins. Ideally, that list now includes the plugin that the user just installed a moment ago. And there's a couple of ways of going about that. One is that you can simply roll through that get available extensions logic again you know, say an on resume of the fragment or something along those lines, he like to go with a different option. In addition to scanning for the uh, currently existing services, he's also monitoring various package broadcasts and action intent, action package added, uh, action package removed, and so forth. And so therefore, you know, if that configuration activity is up, he's detecting these changes and can therefore update that list in real time. And so inside of his actual fragment, where he is managing this stuff, he is setting up a broadcast receiver that is listening for all of the standard actions, added, changed, replaced, and removed. And then he's registering a receiver dynamically for those. And he's going to find out about those package changes and be able to use that to tailor his list in real time. Then dash clock talks to this plugin first by form of using that metadata in order to find out the protocol version. And so back in that manifest, um, and that the, in addition to having the service with the magic action, you also have a series of metadata elements. He elected to have them all be individual metadata elements here. Another approach would be to point to an XML resource file, the way, say, app widgets use the metadata element searchable activities use the metadata element so that you can have a more complex structure without having a whole lot of metadata elements cluttering up your manifest. But either way it works. And so he's going to have you know the simple string description of what the particular package is, I mean extension is so that you can use that for display in that configuration list. The protocol version is does this particular plugin support the notion of a settings activity? And if so, what is the name of that activity? So we can turn around and not only know to display the little settings icon in the entry, but tap on that and be able to go in and launch that particular settings activity. He then turns around and binds to that service. Um, and then in order to be able to request updates that that service has to expose an interface using a particular AIDL construction that ships with dash clock and ships as part of his integration jar um, and that to be able to say, okay, you need to have a binder that implements this AIDL. You're going to need to have that be able to then go in and be exported by your service so that we can bind to it and talk to you. He also has a reverse direction. Plugins can directly talk to dash clock. Dash clock works a little bit like app widgets. Not only can, with app widgets, can the app widget manager decide, okay, I want to ask you, I want to pull an update for the app widget, but your code can push updates to the app widget at any point in time. Dash clock works the same way. You'll periodically pull your plugin to make sure he's got the latest and greatest contents, but if you know of a change and you want to force an update, the plugin can do that at any point in time. He hides this via the dash clock extension class, that's a service subclass that you would wind up subclassing, where he handles most of that AIDL. He handles most of that stuff. You simply override a series of methods uh, representing the hooks and that to provide the particular details, and he takes care of the rest. Plus, you can use this class to be able to push updates up and that even when you aren't being directly called back in by dash clock itself. And so he's hiding that those details of the AIDL, which will help things when he comes to the versioning, is if he comes up with a new AIDL version, you know, that's going to require changes in theory to the underlying application. 
by hiding that inside of his service implementation, he makes it a little bit easier for extension authors to consume. From a security standpoint, he defines a custom permission, read extension data. You can define your own permissions, you're not limited to the ones that ship with Android. His is designed to make sure that the user realizes that, hey, this particular app that you just installed, it's going to be communicating back and forth with Dashcloud. And so the plugin first is going to require that permission. And so the, we're saying, okay, in order to talk to our service, you have to implement this permission. You have to have the corresponding user's permission element for read extension data. Ideally, that's going to limit the applications that talk to this plugin to being dash clock itself. And in turn, um, and that the, you know, we're going to uh, make the, use this in order to control the communications back and forth. Um, and that the, when you uh, send up the updates and that it's also confirming that the, um, the recipient of that broadcast is, or actually the service endpoint, and that is going to wind up receiving uh, that information and it's going to be one that implements that same custom permission. Now, it's a normal permission. It's not a signature level permission, which means any app can claim that it uses this permission. And so this is designed for letting the user know that this communication is going to go on, that these apps are going to interact. It's not limiting the communication to only being between the plugin and via the and via dash clock itself because it's a normal permission. But as we'll see, there's alternatives for that. One of those alternatives is the permission proxy pattern. Permissions in Android apps, you know, you, you wind up in the Goldilocks scenario. If you have too few permissions, you can't have enough features in your app that's going to drive enough interest to cause people to go download it. On the other hand, you know, it's easy to wind up with a mile-long list of permissions. It's one thing for somebody like Facebook to do that. They're a big brand. They can get away with that sort of thing. And that, but, you know, uh, you probably don't have Facebook's brand presence uh, and that and so therefore it's more likely that users are going to cast a jaundiced eye at your app. And so what you want really is just right. You want a list of permissions that is exactly what the user wants to give you and gives enough functionality that the user is interested in. But you can't individually vote up and down permissions in standard Android. But you can elect to migrate those permissions into plugins. You can say that, okay, my application is going to support plugins. I'll be the one who writes these plugins. I'm going to define a custom permission that's signature level. A permission that can only be held by other applications who are signed with the same signing key as signed with the main app. And therefore, doesn't matter that this permission exists. No other apps are out there are going to be able to hold that permission modular security bugs. Um, and, that, and so the, we've got guaranteed privacy of communications between the host and the plugin. The plugin then has not only the permission for, I mean, the, uh, for talking to the host application, but it has some additional plug uh, permission. Read contacts and that access line location. Other things that the user may be a little bit concerned about from a privacy standpoint, that you want to say, all right, I want to isolate that into a plugin. If the user chooses to install the plugin, presumably they're comfortable with that. But I don't have to have the main application cluttering up all that stuff. For example, I have an application. And one second while I try to convince the clips to behave a little bit better. Oh, um, and then I have a pair of applications, a host and a plugin. The host application wants to be able to access the call log. To access the call log, you need to hold the read contacts permission. But this host application doesn't want to hold the read contacts permission because that's scary to some users. And the, you know, maybe this application needs the internet permission for other things, you know, ads or whatever. And 
Read contacts plus internet means contact lists can be slurped up and sent to points unknown. Users don't like that. I don't like that. I try to avoid installing apps that ask for that pair of permission. And so in this case, we're trying to isolate that stuff separately. And so we've got a plugin, CP proxy provider, that holds, I'm not on track, DA for me. You can tell I'm a mouse guy. Not only does it hold the read contacts permission in the plugin, but I define my own custom permission. I define this com.com.swear.android.cpproxy.plugin signature level permission. The only people who are going to be able to simultaneously hold this permission have to be signed by the same sign -in. In my case, I'm defining the permission in both the plugin and the host. That way, it doesn't matter the install order. If for some crazy reason the user wound up installing the plugin first, no problem, and that the permissions will still wind up working. And since it's signature level, they both have to be signed by the same signing key anyway, and so therefore we're not uh, running into any particular security issues. All of this plugin provides is a content provider, call log proxy. We're protecting that provider with the signature level permission. The only people who can talk to this content provider are ones who have that plugin permission. And so only my host application is going to be able to hold that. And I'm exporting a particular authority, com.com.android.cpproxy.call. That in turn is pointing to a call log proxy Java class. Call log proxy is a subclass of an abstract CP proxy. It's a base class that simply provides proxying capabilities as a content provider. It provides a content provider that can proxy another content provider. All this concrete subclass has to do is have a convert URI method that says, oh, okay, we got a request in for this URI. What is the equivalent URI for the content provider we're trying to talk to? And so while my plugin is exposing a content provider saying, oh, hey, I'm exposing this, this call log provider, I am turning around and converting that into things based off of the official call log content provider, call log.calls.content URI taking into account whether or not there's an ID value in the end of the URI itself. Where that abstract base class has implementations of query, insert, update, delete, and so on, that simply turn around and perform the same exact operation with the same parameters via get content resolver, but converts the URIs. And so the host is going to say, hey, plugin provider, please you know, insert this into your provider, that plugin is turning around saying, hey, call log, please insert into the provider, the real provider. I have the read contacts permission. I can do this. Actually, for that, you, for insert, you need write contacts. Um, the only slight wrinkle with this is it comes with queries. The cursor you need to return from query in a content provider has to, uh, be a subclass uh, or an implementation of cross-process cursor, um, and that and the uh, the so like a SQLite cursor implements cross-process cursor. The stuff you get back from a content resolver does not, um, and so there's an inner class in here that handles that and converts the results we get back from content resolver into one that we can pass across process boundaries. My host then in its manifest defines and says that it uses that same custom permission, same signature level permission. When it wants to work with the call log, then rather than actually talking to the call log content provider, we talk to our own plugin's content provider. And so if the plugin is installed, the host application is able to get to the call log even though the host application is not implementing user's permission, asking for the read content the plugin has that. We're talking to the plugin, we are talking to the, um, uh, and, that, and we are talking, um, the plugin is in turn talking to the content provider, the signature level permission is ensuring that we are doing things safely. You might wonder, okay, what are the possibilities for GUI plugins? That's long been a bugaboo here in Android, integrating, you know, 
UIs from other apps into our own. Yeah, a simple approach would be you could have a plugin or extension that exposes content that you load up into a web view in your host. Whether that's being served by a content provider that's implemented by the plugin or it's handing over URLs and that via some sort of a service API or whatever, you load that stuff into a web view and therefore your plugin is controlling whatever the web views portion of your user interface is. The downside of that is, of course, it's not an A to UI, and you got to wonder what's the plugin necessarily doing, particularly if you're looking to use features like add JavaScript interface to expose Java objects from your hosting app into the web view. How are you making sure that that web view, uh, that the code in there is going to somehow use that information in ways that you prefer it did? We've been actually doing plug-in sorts of GUI sharing for years in the form of app widgets and notifications where you customize it to have a progress bar or what have you. And that's been done via remote views. Remote views is a parcelable data structure. You teach it, oh, I want to start with this layout resource and here's how I want to dynamically configure things in terms of setting text on text views or registering pending intents to get control on click events and things like that. That works. You wind up with native UI. Remote views is built into Android. It's relatively straightforward to create an app that the plugin constructs a remote views and hands it over to the host, whether it be via broadcasts and you're packaging the remote views as an intent extra or service integration or what have you. The downside, of course, is that you know there's only so many widgets that remote views supports. You know, there's a dozen or so. And, and, that, and, and not much more. And you still, of course, have to have the other IPC. You're going to need some way of getting that remote views from, from the plugin back to the host. There's nothing stopping you from going in and creating your own remote views replacement. Remote views is just a Java class. Um, and that you can go look at the source code for it. There's not all that much magic to it. Um, and that you're welcome to create your own parcelable class, Remote Views EX, or Super Remote Views, or what have you, where you define your own rules of the game. You say that, okay, well, I want to support more widgets. I want to support custom attributes that we're going to use in order to be able to provide some amount of data binding and that from the host, so that the host can pour the data into the widgets of the plugin. We want to have custom attributes where we embed JavaScript and we use a JavaScript interpreter in order to be able to have dynamic responses inside of this passed over code beyond what a pending intent can do. This isn't something you're going to roll in an afternoon, uh, and that is going to take a fair amount of work. And once again, you start running into security issues as you try to get fancier and fancier with this stuff. And then you say, okay, well, I'm you know, going to use JavaScript in order to uh, allow things to be done more inside of the host process. Well, now you got to make sure that you know exactly what that JavaScript is going to wind up doing and what privileges it has. Activity group, it's technically possible for you to use something like tab activity and then embed an activity from another application. It usually doesn't work. Um, and that the uh, in part because of security issues. I mean the other application is going to have different permissions than yours, and that you may not be able to do the things that you're looking for. And so you'll find the occasional stack a stack overflow recipe for embedding a settings activity into your own app, which then winds up not working because the user can check the checkboxes to their heart's content, but your app doesn't have the permissions to modify that unless you users rooted their device and installed you on the system permission uh, partition. You can use Dex Class Loader for the Android equivalent of the old Java game where we download the jar and dynamically add it to our class path. Um, uh, and then the, uh, you got to be real careful with this sort of stuff. Uh, how are you going to make sure that that jar, or in this case the jar or APK containing text bytecode, is what you think it is? How do you know that that code isn't going to do something nasty, that it hasn't either from the author or from some nefarious third party been modified to contain instructions that would run in your process and do things that your user would really not appreciate? 
um, and that. And so, on the one hand, this gives you the full power and capability of Android, Dolphin Virtual Machine. Um, here there be dragons, um, and that the uh, and that the, this is not for the faint of heart. It'd be awesome if we had some sort of a stock open source library that handled a lot of stuff that, like Dashbot did that Roman had to roll himself. Um, and that which deals with the notion of that we've got activated versus enabled um, uh, or, or uh, available versus enabled plugins and you know handling the notion of dynamically checking for new plugins and maybe dealing with certain naming conventions and that for being able to discover things and so forth. Those plugins for permissions, in theory, you can imagine a generator site where you provide package name information, detail what permissions you want that gives you a custom code base that implements those sorts of proxies uh, and that you can then add to your application um, and that and be able to use those plugins without having to roll all that stuff yourself. And as always, we can use more best practices, whatever that means. So whether you're selling the plugins, selling the SDK, selling custom development of plugins on behalf of an enterprise or somebody else, and that there's ways you could make money off of having some sort of plugin or extension API as part of your app, whether it's private to you or publicly exposed. If it's publicly exposed, now you've got the possibility of this ecosystem that's going to go in and try to help promote your app by writing their own extensions. And in the aggregate, the more capabilities between you and the ecosystem that's provided to your app, the more entertaining your app is, the more likely it is that people are going to find it interesting and will download it. Um, and, that. and bear in mind that you know, people tend to write plugins even if you don't necessarily provide an API for it. I'm not aware that WhatsApp has an actual developer SDK for Android for being able to create plugins for their app, but that doesn't stop people from trying. Um, and that whether they're using accessibility APIs or whatever to try to pretend to be a plugin, and so uh, the bigger your brand, the more likely it is that you're going to want to consider this just to provide a safe way for people to do this stuff. And again, from a permission standpoint, you might consider using plugins to be able to say, all right, I want to isolate my permissions in a separate location uh, and a separate plugin so the users can install only those plugins they want and therefore opt into only the permissions they want, even though Android doesn't support that notion intrinsically. So, plugins are your friends, at least until somebody pokes their eye out, um, and that they make sure you're thinking through the security. If it's your own plugins, you know, use signature level permissions, make sure that only you and the plugin can talk to each other, nobody else can talk to your plugin, and nobody can pretend to be a plugin and therefore cause you problems. If you don't know how the users are gonna find the plugins, don't start coding. And that figure out your distribution strategy first, because it does not matter if you write plugins if the user's got no way to get them. But you've got then the full palette of Android IPC solutions, and I just covered the standard ones. There's all sorts of other uh, options and that, you know, communication via shared preferences and various other clunky mechanisms and that that you may find, while clunky in general may be useful in a particular situation. <laughs> um, and we are just about out of time. I think I've about called us back up to being on schedule. Uh, if you've got questions and that, uh, we'll wait frantically and that and a microphone will magically appear near you or just talk, uh, speak loud. And I think those that ask questions actually have a little prize they're going to get, so. Uh, yes, uh, and that the uh, and that the uh, I'll be offering uh, uh, free subscriptions to my book, uh, Busy Coders Guide to Android Development, for, for good questions. Asking me what my name is will not count as a good question. <laughs> Hi, um, you mentioned um, Trojan uh, and being wary of that. Um, now it's if you're uh, dividing your permissions, that's all right. But uh, if you're allowing others to make use of your core application. What kind of steps can you take to um, prevent that kind of uh, malicious actions, uh, except by just limiting the permissions your core application offers? 
Well, I mean, there's a few things there. I mean, the first is going to be your distribution mechanism, uh, and that the, uh, uh, the bouncer on the Play Store is only so good, uh, and that the but it beats the heck out of necessarily trying to pull that sort of thing off yourself. And so the the more you're concerned about Trojans, you're going to want to think about: Am I using a distribution mechanism that's going to help inhibit the Trojans in the first place? Um, but beyond that, you know, of course, you know, people could download, you know, theoretical plugins to your app from arbitrary easy locations um, and that yeah then it's a question of permissions and API and that the I mean if you are the the dominant flow for these tends to be host talking to plugin and that and so therefore it's a question of okay what data am I distributing to that plugin and that how much of an issue is that going to be the reverse direction if you are allowing the plugin to talk to you then it's a question of what am I exposing what is my binder API look like um, what information, what or what operations could be done to me by the plugin that could be a problem? But in terms of Trojan or not, um, and that signature level permission if it's your own distribution mechanism, and that and beyond that, it's your, it's your classic how do we detect Trojans anywhere, which is um, uh, uh, look a blimp, and you, the expert scurries away from the question. Uh, so basically, anticipation um, and defensive coding. Right. No different than many other places in that, just a greater surface area. I will see me in that, I will get you your card. Other questions? Is it assumed that this, the, the permission that requires the same signing key, that that's the same organization? Or is there ever a case where you're actually sharing signing keys with trusted developers? You trust developers? <laughs> I mean, I'm here and I'm using hotel Wi-Fi, so. <laughs> Uh, the um, the uh, signing keys are, you know, are are dangerous piece, and uh, those are the sorts of things that you know, say like an open source project. You you want to have a secure way of maybe getting it to the handful of people who are who are eligible to create authorized bills, but you do not want to be checking into your GitHub repo. Um, and that the uh, so usually that's the same organization, um, and that the um, and that you you got to be a little bit careful, uh, and that the you know. What happens if we've got you know a consulting arrangement, uh, and that's why you know, generally they recommend you know use individual signing keys per project to make sure that you can give the signing key to those who uh, hired you, and that since they uh, may elect to you know do something else in the future, um, and that but the uh, but yeah, I mean, the, you you want to it's the sort of thing you, you want to control the distribution, which means it's got to be something where it is. Um, it's not just publicly exposed, uh, and that the and if you do accidentally commit it to your repo, and that I uh, 